Hello, everybody, and welcome to a recap of the Treaty United Save. The end of Season 6 ha has upon us. It has happened to us. And now we're going to recap all of those things. If you do enjoy these, of course, drop a like on it. And if you are new to the channel, then this is the stream save, which you'll be able to catch right now, live over on Twitch. We're literally streaming it as we speak, doing transfer stuff. And you're not going to want to miss this transfer window, is all I can say, for stuff and reasons you'll find out later in this video. <laughs> and of course, the full VODs for all of the streams, and there's been quite long ones over the past couple of weeks, can be found on the second channel. Link in the description to that as well. So, as is the tradition uh, on these little recaps, we're going to actually start by looking at some of of the well the, the youth players the, the best that came through our academy this year and it's the worst year yet strongest player in this year's youth intake was jimmy o'shea we were promised a an average youth intake a sort of three or four star i think it was three stars that they were predicting naturally got half a star again so at this point basically no matter what it says we're going to get in a youth intake we get nothing in our youth intakes they're always one star or half star no matter what it says we're going to get that's what we get he was our best player another goalkeeper Ah, oh, dearie me. It's it's going to be a while. We are trying to invest in infrastructure when we get some money come along. It's just a question of fighting with the border. It certainly was for much of this season to try to get anything done. Uh, despite having a decent amount of money in the bank, they wouldn't let me improve youth recruitment, junior coaching, anything's like that, unfortunately. And I think that's going to hamper us for quite some time. But we will eventually be able to get there. And maybe one day we'll actually get a homegrown talent that's worth his weight in gold. Because as things stand, the best player still uh, from the, that we've had at any point during the save come through the youth intake is Nathan Daly. 21 years old now. Uh, I said we were going to try and get him on loan. We just couldn't seem to. Uh, nobody really wanted him. Hopefully next year we can make a change there and finally get him cracking out there. He only made eight appearances this year and he needs football. But the thing is, he also is also a homegrown player, which is extremely important for European matches. And that's another one of the reasons why it's more difficult and most of the rest of the youngsters that you'll recognize that have come through the academy have just sadly moved on for the most part this season uh saitama has left gone to longford town various other players that you may remember from early in the save have also moved on including roy kent uh, evan dunn that is on to one of the things i'm sure you're very very excited about and that is the signings that we've made this season to carry us through season six with treaty united gonna start with some outs because i feel like there has actually been enough to talk about this time so firstly callum O'Dowd went out on loan to longford town this season played a few games didn't do too particularly bad. He'll be leaving at the end of the season anyway. Yunus Tafiki uh, was on loan at Shelbourne in the second tier this year. Got a decent number of appearances. Some goals for him too, which is kind of nice. He will count as a homegrown player for us at some point too. So it's important to keep him playing and getting him some football. Not yet, and not until the season after next, but it's still important to have. We also sold Fabio Dabo to Alverca for £350,000. Now you think, why on earth would you do that when he was one of your sort of quality midfielders? Essentially, the situation was this. He came to me and said, I don't think I'm going to be ever good enough to be a starter in your team and I was like that's really weird considering that you are playing for us and starting matches for us on the regular very odd don't know why but it happened and I was unable to convince him that he was good enough to play in our starting 11 despite that literally being what he was doing we suspect that maybe his squad status was too high but he was playing all the time and then said that he didn't think he was good enough to play for us. So yeah, eventually we just decided to sort of bin the situation off, sell him for £350,000, get some cash and also get the trouble out of the way. And it was all profit for us when you think about it. We signed him on a free, moved him on for 350 k It's always good, I suppose. Now we're one. Jack Arrowsmith, one of our youngsters, went on loan to Longford Town in the second tier this year. Banged 10 goals. 10 goals! for him, which was incredible. Spent the entire time complaining that he was being played out of position. I'm like, mate, you're banging in goal, hand of a fist. He got like 10, I think, in his first 13 league games. Didn't really score so much towards the end of the season, but what a start for him. Presumably they started playing him in his actual role. We also sold Jake Vokins to Ipswich Town for £100,000. Uh, they came in with the bid. We felt it was the right time to make that kind of move, which was mainly because he was also going to want that move too. So we just kind of decided to let it happen. The first of whom was Ben Knight, former Manchester City youth player. Uh, we just felt the opportunity was right for us we picked him up on a relatively cheap deal originally he'd wanted way more money so we weren't interested we came back in and he actually was very interested seven goals and six assists over well 41 appearances in all comps this year it's not amazing but he still contributed to the cause this year i think he could have mm, could have maybe chipped in with I, I think he's chipped in with about the same amount of goals as you'd expect him to playing on the right or through the middle uh is like an attacking mid so i'm happy with the signing it wasn't costing us loads of money either next up was jacob carno joining us on a free transfer from san felix he was actually in one of the next gens he's the first next gen player we were able to sign in this save we were surprised. Now, he is obviously a striker, but he has no finishing or composure. So, yeah, we thought about this and thought maybe actually he'd be better off as a winger uh, with the crossing and dribbling and the speed, which is where he's not predominantly operated, but he has operated there a lot. And he's been sensational this year. I've got to be honest, like 19 starts, but 11 goals and seven assists for Jacob Carnu uh, this year. Really, really good player. Only 20 years old. More room to come. Is a little bit injury prone, but still. But the biggest signing we made in probably the entire save up to this point is Michael Sharif. 
joins us from Crew Alexandra for £470,000. 475. He is definitely our record signing by quite some margin in this save. And I felt that he was absolutely worth it because he's six foot five. He's quick. He's got 50. 16 finishing, reasonable composure. He's actually, despite the height, actually only has a seven heading, which has let him down a little bit in places this year, but he is still a fantastic player. 41 appearances and 27 goals and seven assists. 34 goal contributions and 42 appearances is pretty damn stonking for me. 14 in the league in there too, uh, six in the Champions League, six in the Europa. The guy has genuinely had a, a great season. We also signed Barry Cunningham, an Irishman in from Aldershot Town for £135,000. This was one of the reasons that Jake Vokins was allowed to leave to it twitch is because we felt that barry cunningham could kind of do a bit of both he is a very interesting player may not have the same sort of technical ability going forward with his crossing and dribbling but he's got lovely physicals some lovely mentals and he's a versatile player that can cover a center back uh, if we needed him to and he has been needed to this season and has managed to play 45 games for us this year in all competitions which is an astonishing amount of matches we were able to bring lewis hayes back in we didn't think we were going to be able to at one point but we were and also if we were be able to are able to get him for another season next year, which my fingers are crossed, hoping that we will. He might also count as a homegrown player for us, potentially, which would be pretty damn cool. Next up is another sort of signing for the future. 20-year-old Nathan Hosker joined us for, I think, £62,000. And, I mean, you can see why I was interested in this guy. Having him play as that attacking midfielder, just, oh, I mean, the passing, the vision, the technique, the first touch. He's still young, still has plenty of room to grow. Uh, he's been out alone at Derry City for the second half of the season, which hasn't really gone fantastically for him, but we felt that it would just be important to get him some first-team football. And in that same boat is Adam Miles, another of these types of players. We just found so many quality players like this this season. On a free transfer, this guy from Gateshead, for free, we were able to bring him in. And again, he reminds me a lot of Connor Panini, just another one of these players from Gateshead, ironically, that just has ridiculous technical abilities. First touch, long shots, passing, technique. It's fantastic. His passing and vision is astonishingly good. We also took on loan Issa Sam uh, Samadiane on loan from Strasbourg this year. We haven't had as many players on loan because our relationship with Bologna has somewhat soured, and I expect our relationship with Strasbourg may well go the same way. May well look for a new senior affiliate next season, as unfortunately, uh, we're not going to be able to get any more players from Bologna, basically. Uh, so we'll have to look for a new one to try and stale some players from. So that will mean that the likes of Mazia will probably be uh, gone and not coming back, sadly, because he's been good for us this year. We also signed Ed McGinty for £80,000 from Sligo Road. Now, I know it's a team from, it's another, it's a team, it's a player from an Irish team. I realise that. And we kind of just put that aside for the reasons. We'll talk about a bit more about what happened and why Ed McGinty signed for us a little bit later in the video, because y you'll see why. But yeah, backup goalkeeper, homegrown, which is part of the reason for some European stuff that we needed Ed McGinty as well, but just a good keeper too. The last of the signings that we made this year was Connor Coventry, another Irish midfielder who could kind of do a bit of both for us, which is kind of the reason. Now, he actually signed in the middle of the season because unfortunately, Regan Booty picked up a serious injury that kept him out for three months in a match against Hammerby in the, uh, the Champions League. And unfortunately, that left us with an enormous... Well, I'll, I'll just let me explain. The booty hole is somewhat... Uh, plugged. <laughs> we found a butt plug. But luckily, Connor Coventry was there to save the day. And I think he's done okay for us so far. You know, one goal, three assists. He's not really there for goal scoring. He's more there just to sort of steady that midfield. And I think he was definitely worth it, uh, the former West Ham man. So yeah, happy with Connor Coventry. He's joined us too. And that is the final signing that we've made this season. One other downside though, is our goalkeeper, Bart Verbruggen, right towards the end of the year. Uh, sadly, well, he broke his ankle. Uh, I think it was his ankle. And it was going to be out for nine months. Or was it his leg? Either way, he's out for a very long time. And he's not going to be back till like May. Which makes it even more sensible that we'd signed Ed McGinty in the first place. But luckily, as the season got off to a start, the board decided to make some changes. And I'd be like, right. You know, we've got this brilliant idea. It's going to benefit the club massively. We're all good. Here's what we're going to come up with. We're going to increase the amount of wages available for performance analysts or something. So we pretty much got off to the dream start in the league. I'm not going to be quite as in detail in some of the league stuff because I know that can kind of drag a little bit. So we got off to a great start with a 3-2 victory. Then had a good 0-0 draw away at Dundalk, who had a very weird season. More on that later. Then three straight victories. We weren't even conceding goals. Waterford dispatched. Farps dispatched more on them later as well. Scammer Rovers dispatched easily in there too. Draws in there as well, but just basically winning matches, not conceding goals, and absolutely flying. But it really allowed us to build a nice little gap at the start of the season towards the top of the table. And really starting to look like a team that could smash a few sides about and actually win the league a relative comfortable comfortable level, which is what we wanted this year. 
that good run, obviously we lost in the cup to Watford. It was a bit embarrassing, unfortunately. We were two goals to the good uh, going into the 81st minute and then they scored three in the final 10 minutes to bin us out of the cup. But we didn't really care that much, but good lore, we could have done without that. But then, uh, you know, good result coming up again. Got a draw against Derry City and then beat Bohemian away from home. Then we finally did get our first defeat in the league of the season, which was away, sorry, at home rather, against St. Pat's. Unfortunate, really, as I don't think we actually deserved to lose this match. We were still the better side, but Stephen Christopher came back to haunt his old club and ended our game, our unbeaten run, I think, at 24 matches, which is still pretty bloody good. But sadly, that puts on a little bit of a downward spiral, as often these things do, as we then got a one-all draw at home to Drogheda, and then were beaten at home by Waterford in the league in the next two matches. It's kind of nuts, really, how you can go on such an outrageous run you lose one game that you probably don't deserve to lose and then all of a sudden you just can't buy a win thankfully though we had time to schedule some friendlies during this period and it seemed to steady the ship a little bit as we got back to winning ways with a 4-1 victory against dundalk absolutely smashed them which was fantastic a draw with scamrock and then you know a good win over the farps and a win against sligo rovers which is what you like to see because it was in this victory against sligo rovers prior to the match we decided that we needed a homegrown goalkeeper to allow us to register an extra player for our champions league squad just to have more options in that that way it would free up a slot for an outfield player to be non-homegrown essentially so we had a little bit through the lick a lick a look through the league to see if we could find one we then of course found ed mcginty put a bid in prior to this game without realizing we were playing sligo rovers in the very next match and then well this happened should we steal mcginty from sligo <laughs> feel bad for sligo approach to sign get one a free transfer there you go have ed mcginty <laughs> who we're playing against next exactly we've got in his head you know he's, he's brand new to the club he's got to learn our style of play and whatnot McGinty's get What in the actual fuck was that chat? The ultimate in Jimmy's rustled. We've got in his head. Unfortunately, that sort of still set us on a bit of a downward spiral, then losing at home. Sorry, yeah, at home to Derry City. Disappointing. Then drawing with some pats, which wasn't too bad. Unfortunately, we were then knocked out of the FAI Cup by Rockmount, <laughs> which was just not what you wanted. We played a heavily rotated side in this one and it just did not go well for us. They took the lead from a penalty. We then had two men sent off in the match. George Nunn found us the equaliser. We ended up losing to them on penalties in the end, which was very, very misfortunate. We didn't really let it affect us as four more wins in a row in the league without even really looking threatened in those matches pushed us back towards the top and gave us a lovely cushion at the top of the division, which is exactly what we needed. And we found ourselves level on points at the top with St. Pat's. However, we had three matches in hand on them and that was the key, except that went terribly wrong. As we then proceeded to draw our next five league games in a row and go winless for the rest of the season. I've never seen anything like it, honestly. It was nuts. And the thing is, we won comfortably the better side in almost every game. Just to give you some examples of the sort of results that were happening, like these, nil-nil, following game against Drogheda, again, nil-nil, Derry City, this was one all, took a 94th minute free kick from Jacob Carno to get us the draw in this one. This one was even worse, we were in front, they even had a red card and we still drew one all. Finally against some Pats, we did finally get one that sort of went our way, but we were still conceding a 94th minute equaliser in this one as well. It was utterly insane. Now, the thing is, this had also coincided with some defeats in Europe too, and there's a segment here where all of a sudden we just become the worst team in football. Football. Unfortunately, in this period, because we had so many defeats, there was defeats in Europe and these poor results in the league. And I think it was windless in nine at one point. We'll come to Europe stuff in a bit. We decided that now would be a good time to have a team meeting to just try to G everybody up. And at that point, we witnessed one of the dumbest things I've seen in ages. Essentially, I don't have a clip of this to hand. We went into the team meeting with, I think it was windless in nine. There was more defeats in there, obviously, because of the European stuff. And I basically said to the players, look, I know things have, you know, the whole don't let your heads drop. I want to encourage you. We're doing fine. I did that and every single player reacted with furious and I've never seen a bigger drop in team dynamics than I have from that one meeting. It probably, we were in the positives and it took us down to, I would say 80% red down into the bottom. Like it shaved off the most insane amount of morale that I've ever seen from one team meeting. The irony being, of course, that we then went into the next match and I got the option to then hold a team meeting about how important the match was. So we did it and it actually worked for once. We actually got a positive response from saying that we should win the title. Every player was very pleased and then it maybe gave you a sliver tiny sliver back of what we'd just lost. Mental. And you probably sat there thinking, well, if you were level on points with uh, St. Pat's going into those final six matches and you didn't win a single one of them, presumably you didn't win the league. Well, good news, everyone. We actually did win the league. Insanely, we managed to still win the league. Thankfully, the draw against St. Pat's allowed us to just keep a tiny little bit of a cushion to them. And it meant that essentially they had to beat Dundalk in order to have a chance of 
winning the league on the final day of the season and they didn't they drew nil nil with dundalk which basically handed us the title in the end uh, it meant that we had level points to them and a better goal difference and we went into the final game against bohemians as long as we didn't lose 11 nil to them we would be champions we did still lose though <laughs> of course um, but we did in fact manage to win the league with that as you'll see in the end ended up winning it on goal difference uh kind of nutty same exact record as st pat's this season mental scenes to win it like that considering how far clear we were at one point and to see the way the finish where things went it was mental another mental thing is you'll notice that finn harps uh, were relegated with 11 points now it was worse than that for many 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 weeks of the season and in fact so bad was their season that i have to show you this they conceded 112 goals this year and if it wasn't for getting two wins in their final three games of the season they would have finished on five points and winless uh, that was how bad their season was this year minus 73 goal difference and the ironic thing is they technically had a better statistical record than waterford did but their goalkeeper let in four 40 goals more than he should have done to give you an idea the second worst was like minus five they were like five left five more goals than they should have done and he's then like the 40s but you also notice that dundalk managed to win the cup to qualify for europe now they did end up finishing on 48 points in sixth which is a poor season for them but it could have been so 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 very much worse when i show you the past positions yeah <laughs> You'll notice that Dundalk spent most of their season in the relegation places. Um, up until match day 28, they were in the relegation zone, essentially in the playoff zone. And at one point, were as much as seven points behind Waterford, who were sitting in eighth at the time. Thankfully, Dundalk strung some wins together with a new manager towards the end of the year, and it did allow them to haul themselves up to sixth and end up finishing comfortably clear and able to win the cup, which puts them back into Europe for next year. What a Cinderella story that is, because they're a strong side. We know it. We need them in Europe. Now then, Europe. I could call myself a six foot tall bodybuilder named mo it doesn't actually make it so although i am six foot tall and extremely buff so you would have already had some clues as to how things went for us in europe this season uh given by some of the teams i've mentioned and some of the things you may have seen in player stats however champions league first round qualifiers we got apollon limassol the cypriot champions uh, and we beat them 6-3 on aggregate so it, they actually were pretty good over both legs, but we managed to just get goals, and Michael Sharif was on fire in Europe over this period, so it really did help us out a lot. We then had a particularly impressive tie against Cluj in the second round of the Champions League qualifiers, actually managing to beat them at home and then get a one-all draw away in Romania with Michael Sharif scoring to put us through to the third round of the Champions League qualifiers, and more importantly, guaranteeing ourselves group stages of something and therefore at least two and a half million pounds in revenue coming into the club, but we felt we could go further. To get those two done so quickly was such a dream for us. Fortunately, we drew Hamilton in the next round. Matsia's red card in the first half was immediately uh, preceded by Aloisa Matko uh, giving them the lead, which did not do us any favours. Incredibly, though, we then went to Sweden and were able to get a victory and won 2 1 and took the whole damn thing to penalties. Um, Panini's goal levelled things up early on. We were smashing them, had tons of chances in this match and looked like a really good side. They then took the lead in extra time, but luckily Michael Sharif equalised for us, but then we lost on penalties in the end. Terrible times. Even weirder is the fact that you'll notice a player on our bench in this game and who actually featured called Roy Galvin. So essentially, prior to this match, um, we had a, a wealth of suspensions and injuries to our Champions League registered players. And as a result, we weren't able to actually field a full team and bench for the match. And as a result, grayed out players were actually put into our bench for this one. We had no choice but to put them there. Then, such was our desperation during the second half of this match, we decided to throw on one of them, a man named Roy Galvin, who not only came on and did an okay job, but actually scored a penalty in the ensuing penalty shootout, which then earned him, of course, a contract at the club he was a great out player he's not good and he's on a hundred pound a week for a year but he still managed to earn himself a contract and then ironically in the final win that we actually got in the league this season against farps this happened heinz knight love it galvin yes come on <laughs> Roy Galvin in the 92nd minute scores the winner against the Farps. What a finish from the boy. Roy the boy, bottom corner, legend. Insane. So we felt a bit hard done by by getting knocked out there, but it happens. We could have gone that little step further, but at least we still had Europa. And that option was against uh, Budo oh, hang on. Budoshnost. Podgorica of Montenegro. I'm sure I butchered part of that at least. But we were able to breeze past them with a 4-0 victory in uh Montenegro and it was just very easy even though we did end up actually drawing the home leg because I was a little bit distracted have we got a have they just had a red card while I was looking at Alice's pictures that sounds terrible I'm so <laughs> 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 we
We got off to quite a slow start in our group, which featured Osiak, Fenerbahce, and Ferenc Varos. Um, but, you know, we, we took the lead away at Osiak, which was extremely important, uh, but unfortunately gave away a penalty not long after to then butcher it, because we felt that if we had any chance at getting through or getting third, and thus uh, Conference League, knockouts after Christmas, we needed to get a result against Osiak. So a draw away wasn't the end of the world. But unfortunately, it was around about here uh, with the loss to Fenerbahce through uh, David Teniec, oh, sorry, Tianic, uh, which wasn't a huge surprise. Let's face it, it's Fenerbahce. They were comfortably the best side in this group. That was seemingly what set us onto this outrageous losing spiral that we just could not seem to escape from, as you'll notice here when these matches sort of fit in. And then it got even worse as we were hammered 4-1 by the Hungarians, Ferenc Varos, uh, with Lewis Hayes sent off for handball in this match after just 22 minutes. Mental. There was a penalty in there too. 4-1, uh, absolute hammering. And it was around about this point that we decided to try that team meeting. And well, you know what happened there. It only made things worse. Luckily, by the time we come around to our next European match, the league season had finished and we got some confidence back, which then allowed us to put in a stunning performance that then beat Ferric Farris by a goal to nil through Michael Sharif. We had a great performance, got the win, and finally started to get a little bit of groundwork going. Also won the Irish Champions Cup, but you don't care about that. But suddenly, the results were just coming. We had a complete morale boost as a result of winning the league, despite our form not changing, and all of a sudden, we started winning matches again, as we then smashed um, Osiek four goals to two. Michael Sharif with four goals in this match, absolutely destroying them and giving ourselves a real chance, certainly of getting third in our group and with an outside chance of even getting second. And that is exactly what we did. We went to Turkey and beat Fenerbahce by two goals to nil. Matsia and Kano's goals just hit them with the one-two punch. And all of a sudden, literally, we won our last six matches of the season, the moment that the morale got that big bump from us winning the league, <laughs> despite losing the match. It's mental how much of an effect morale can have. Losing one game can just screw you. Not even winning a match can just suddenly put you back onto form. And the group ended up finishing like this with us on 10 points in the end, digging ourselves out of a mad hole. We had one point from our first three matches, won our last three, and were able to qualify for the next round of the Europa League. And I believe that makes us the first Irish side ever to qualify for the knockouts of the Europa League. So that's extremely impressive from the guys. Really does help us out. Now, we've been drawn against Basel, which is one of those ones that could go either way, honestly. They're a Champions League dropout side who had quite a weak group. So we're not really sure how that one's going to go. It's certainly going to be no, not as easy as Krasnodar was or whoever it was that we played last time. Ludogorets, I think it was. No, it was Krasnodar, wasn't it? Needless to say, that's going to be very difficult for us. But just getting there in the first place is a huge help. And of course, the money that's come with it has really, really helped the club improve this season. And this is when things take an even stranger turn. I know, more twists and turns. Imagine. After the season had finished and we were just sort of wrapping up some final few things before the Fenerbahce game, we got a news article saying that our chairman was looking to step aside. Do you know how these things happen? It happens. Usually the club just gets taken over by someone else from the board or whatever, and you move on with your life. But then news articles started flooding in about consortiums wanting to take us over. We then got placed under a transfer embargo. This was all happening in the space of a week, by the way. Usually these things get drawn out for ages. And then we got a news article saying that two different consortiums were vying to buy the club, which is nuts. And I've never seen two go in there before. But in addition to that, the news article also told us that... One of the consortiums, run by a guy called James Martin, maybe the chef, who knows, wanted to sack me and replace me with a new manager. Scary. Because if we'd have got sacked as a result of this, I would have been livid. The other consortium, by a guy called Mike Murphy, wanted to keep me in place. So we were sat there praying that he was the guy that was going to take over the club. And then the news article came through. We sat there with crossed fingers, waiting to see the name of the guy, because we saw the fact that they wanted to have a meeting with me, and we didn't know which way this was going to go. But it was Mike Murphy, the guy that wanted to keep us in charge, and actually seemed to have a great deal of... um respect for us that wanted to take over the club had been successful in doing so and as a result we keep our job and get the wonderful new chairman in mike murphy and i say wonderful for so many reasons one he saved the club in a way he also kept my job which saves us in a way and saves the save because we were preparing for the ultimate revenge story had we been sacked as a result of a board takeover that would have been infuriating he plunged well, he plunged personally £2 million into the club of his own money. And in addition to that, he also bumped our weight, our transfer budget from £1.3 million to £4 million. Now, obviously, I've moved a bit of it into wage budget, um, but originally it was a £4 million transfer budget that he did. Because when we got to the end of the season, we had all this extra money. The board didn't give us any additional transfer funds for next year. And I was like, well, that's kind of shit. Um, but then Mike Murphy has come in and saved the day and given us an insane £4 million quid to spend over this transfer window, which is what we're probably doing right now when you're watching this video. So if you want to head over to Twitch and see that, well, good luck us trying to spend it, I suppose. But we're just going to be enjoying basking in the warm glow of Mike Murphy and his wonderful new, very rich bosom. Now, 
As for the other sides in Europe this season in Ireland, obviously they were all in the Europa Conference League and had some pretty plum draws. You'll see that Sligo Rovers knocked out Trepane of San Marino in the first round, 7-1, and Bohemian were able to beat a Kosovan side to get through. Now, you might be wondering, where's the third one? Yeah, so weirdly, because of, I don't know, some kind of mismatch and stuff, one of our teams got a bye to the second round, and it was actually the team Shelbourne, who had won the cup and were currently playing in the second division whilst playing in Europe. They actually got a bye to the second Europa Conference League round. Now, whether that's good or bad, I'll let you decide, because obviously it meant they missed out on opportunities to win coefficient points, and, well, it got worse for them. Sligo Rovers were then beaten 6-2 on aggregate by Ludogorets, but they did get a 2-all draw in there, which is good for coefficient. Shelbourne were then humped 5-2 by Rijeka, uh, sadly. It, it wasn't particularly great. But again, they got a 2-all draw against them, and thus coefficient points. Thankfully, though, incredibly, Bohemian were able to beat Chavez from a 2-0 deficit, were able to knock out a Portuguese side to at least progress them to the next round. Where they found themselves up against Swedish club Malmö, they only went out on penalties. That's the second straight season that a team has gone out on penalties to Malmö, uh, one of our Irish sides. So they did an okay job, and we were left to sort of carry the mantle from then on, but they did at least do all right. As coefficient-wise, that leaves us here. We've got 4.875 this year. So the point is, most importantly, we are improving over the season that we're losing by a good two points. So that's the main thing. Having a better year than last year, nowhere near as good as our Europa Conference League uh, run, obviously. But still, maybe there's a chance to get past Basel and maybe get one more little point on there. Maybe just draw one of the legs. I don't know. Point is, though, we are going to finish, hopefully anyway, at this rate, above Israel and Serbia and move up even further to 20 27th place in the coefficient chart. So it's definitely a nice, consistent stream of goodness uh, going in the right directions there. And more importantly than that is that next year we're going to be losing the worst season of the five that we've got. So there's going to be a huge amount of room, I would say, next year for even an average year of like a 4.8 would potentially gain us up to overtaking the likes of Norway and potentially Romania in there as well, should the right stuff fall our way. So I think next year there's a real chance of major gains being made, particularly with the quality of the sides that we'll have in Europe too. We'll have St. Pats, we'll have Dundalk, and I think it's Derry City is the other one, unfortunately. Uh, or is it Bohemian? Either way, we've got strong sides in Europe, which is the main thing, and we'll hopefully be one of them. Well, hopefully, we will be one of them. And it is going to give us a little bump as well, because it will move everybody straight into that second qualifying round. So it might cause problems potentially if they can't qualify out of that round but at the very least they'll have a chance to start a little bit further on and maybe get a bit of a bump from that too so we're going to hopefully move up to 27th of course for this season of the qualifiers two of them will go straight into the second round anyway but yeah it's going to be a while before we can get up to the likes of 17th and actually get that uh bump into another championship round and really 15th is where things really start to take off when you get that second team in the champions league and a team in the europa league guaranteed so that's where things really start to motor one more thing of course to show you is just people said they wanted to see the irish national team uh they're 47th in the world right now uh qualifying group is not our oh, hasn't even started for them in fairness so we can not really see too much of that uh schedule over the last few years wow group c uh they're currently playing it ironically with northern ireland in there too moldova relegated but that's kind of nuts that they're in the c division uh as far as the maybe that's where they are in real life but i don't think they are looks like it doesn't matter because they're back up into b division so i guess they've got that going for them and as for the actual senior squad itself well i mean let's just look at like highest paid players nathan collins of burnley is very highly rated mark travers of bournemouth obviously uh Kuvin kelleher in there too um Adara Mola from Crystal Palace. He's a very young player, isn't he? Yes. Eight caps, though. Um, but as far as I know, no regens have yet to really uh, spring onto the scene. There is a guy who's at Aberdeen who... Hello, this guy's not got a club and he's in the Irish national team. Would you like a trial, sir? <laughs> How the hell did you get in there, Tony? I don't think he'll say yes to us, but still... He's not got a club. But yeah, there's a guy at Aberdeen who's on loan from Manchester City. I've shown you him before, uh, Sean Kennedy, who I think is still the future of the Irish national team. I think he might have an injury or something at the moment. But needless to say, if there's anyone that's going to lead Ireland to glory, it'll probably be him. Uh, we've tried several times to get him on loan, but they won't quite let us have him. Maybe this is the year that it happens because we're in the Europa League. I, I don't know. Aberdeen aren't, are they? Or are they? I think they are, actually. So that sort of wraps things up for us. So our plans for next season are pretty straightforward. We're just going to strengthen the squad in a few areas that we need to, which we'll be doing right now over on stream, preparing ourselves to really bomb into the next year. But knowing for a fact, obviously, that we've got that game against Basel in February, or those two matches against Basel in February. So the start of our season is going to be a little bit uh, funky with Europa League in there too. We just want to make sure we get off to a strong start, keep pushing for things, and then hope that this year we can finally put the title to bed without some kind of drama like we have had in virtually every season, it seems like. It'd just be nice to win it at a bit of a canter. Hopefully this is the year that we're capable of doing that. But if not, expect to join me for season seven where i'm just like oh my god we went on a 19 game winless run or something hopefully that's not the case i'd quite like to keep my job hopefully mike murphy will allow that to happen so if you have enjoyed this drop a like that'd be lovely if you're new to the channel subscribe stream on twitch right now so just, just, just join us right now come and say hi if you reach this point in the video and you're going to come over on stream drop the word smint in the chat i'll know what it means chat might not that's even funnier in a way isn't it really so i'll see you guys soon hold your gun capybara bye-bye